Muhammad al Fatih was of the powerful sultans of the Ottoman Empire. He's the one who destroyed the Byzantine Empire and conquered many lands and kingdoms. Of them, Corinthia, Galata, Argos, and Genova. He personally led the army that surrounded Belgrade, the capital of Serbia. They conquered it by Allah's bounty and assumed authority over the Greek kingdom, Turmburin. In 1462, he conquered Romania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Albania, and Konya became a part of the Ottoman Empire. In 1476, he conquered Hungary and Moldova. It is enough boast for him that he fulfilled the prophecy of the prophet, Constantinople will be conquered. How excellent a leader is its leader, and how excellent an army is that army. It wasn't until 857 years after the Hijra, on the 20th of Jumad al-Awwal, and the 21-year-old Muhammad ibn Murad gained his title, Al-Fatih, the conqueror, by fulfilling the prophecy of Allah's messenger by liberating Constantinople. He renamed the city Islambol, the city of Islam, protected its Christian residents, and went on a campaign of redeveloping the city to even greater heights than the Byzantines had achieved. He commissioned the improvement of the city's sanitation system, utilized clean sources of water for its citizens, opened kitchens for the hungry, and ordered the building of many of the masajid and universities that we can still see today. Muhammad al-Fatih was born on 27th Rajab, 835 after Hijra, 30th March, 1432. He was brought up under the supervision of his father, Sultan Murad II, the seventh Ottoman Sultan. His father prepared and trained him to shoulder the responsibilities of the position of a Sultan. Muhammad al-Fatih memorized the Quran, learned the prophetic narrations, Islamic jurisprudence, mathematics, astronomy, and the skills required for war. He also learned Arabic, Persian, Latin, and Greek languages. He joined his father in his battles and conquests. His father appointed him as a ruler of a small emirate so that he could receive practical training on administering state affairs under the supervision of some of the top scholars of that time. This matter influenced the character of the young prince and tinted his personality with Islamic morals and manners. Sheikh Aq Shamsuddin, one of the scholars who supervised the upbringing and education of Muhammad al-Fatih, managed to inculcate in his heart the spirit of fighting in the cause of Allah and the desire to be a person with high ambition. He also inspired Muhammad to do the impossible, to conquer what had been the most powerful city in the world at that time, that is Constantinople. The seed had been planted, and Muhammad al-Fatih dedicated his youth to prepare for what came to be the most important achievement in his life, defeating the Byzantine Empire and conquering Constantinople. After the death of his father, Sultan Murad II, on 7th February 1451 AC, Muhammad al-Fatih took over and became the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. He was a strong young man, only 20 years old, very enthusiastic and ambitious. He was thinking of the conquest of Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. This dream overwhelmed him to the extent that he would not talk about any subject except for the conquest of Constantinople. He would not even allow anyone who was sitting with him to talk 
except about the expected conquest. The first step in achieving his dream was to take control of the Strait of Bosporus so that he could prevent any support or supplies that might come to Constantinople from Europe. So he built a huge castle on the European seashore of the Strait of Bosporus. Along with the top senior officials, he personally participated in building the castle. It took three months to build this castle that came to be known as the Roman castle. On the other bank of the Strait of Bosporus, there was the castle of Anatolia. It then became impossible for any ship to cross unless it obtained permission from the Ottoman forces. Constantinople was also fortified by the Theodosian walls. These walls were a triple row of fortifications. This means that there were three walls stacked in front of each other. The outer wall had a patrol track. The middle wall provided a firing platform to shoot down on opposing forces attacking the first wall. And the inner wall was five meters thick and 12 meters high, making it the biggest of the three walls. All this made the city of Constantinople impregnable and withstood landslide sieges for 800 years. Even previous sultans from the Ottoman Empire tried and failed to capture the Byzantine capital. Although the Byzantines had been successful in crushing any military force that would attack their city walls, they had no help from Western Christian allies because of a crushing defeat to the Crusader army in the Battle of Varna, 1444, at the hands of Muhammad's father, Murad II. That battle and the Battle of Kosovo, 1448, deterred the European states from sending any substantial military assistance to aid the Byzantines. Also, the Byzantines did not want to unite the Pope's church with theirs, so that didn't help strengthen the relationship. Constantinople had withstood sieges for 800 years, which means they had primarily dealt with weapons made in the Middle Ages. Al-Fatih had one thing which previous besiegers of Constantinople lacked, cannon power. A talented engineer managed to make a number of cannons for the Sultan. One of these cannons, never known before that time, was 700 tons, and its projectile weighed 1,500 kilograms. The sound of its shell could be heard from a long distance away. It was pulled by 100 oxen, aided by 100 strong men. This giant cannon was called the Sultanic Cannon. Muhammad al-Fatih was a military genius. His strategic war planning was unparalleled and is evident in his attention to war preparations. His war strategies can be divided into two stages which are the pre-war strategies and those while the war was ongoing. Muhammad al-Fatih adopted a grand strategy as a pattern of pre-war strategies. Grand strategy is the process by which all the means available to the state are considered in pursuit of continuing political influence. This involves planning in terms of diplomacy, information, military and economic power in terms of the political strategy before he attacked Constantinople. Muhammad al-Fatih signed peace treaties with three states, Serbia, Bulgaria, and Hungary. Stipulated in these treaties are the duties of the states to uphold ceasefire with the Ottomans and not to meddle into any war affairs that the Ottomans have with any other states. Muhammad al-Fatih managed to accumulate a special fund before the war was actually waged. This was a part of his economic strategy. This involved increasing taxes from states under Ottoman protection and introducing economic policies which allowed him to take control of certain products in the trading sector. Militarily strategizing would require a large proportion of Muhammad al-Fatih's focus. Muhammad al-Fatih was able to amass hundreds of thousands of foot soldiers as well as cavalries, gunmen, 
and gun carriage drivers from all over the regions. The Ottoman naval forces were formidable and their sea power lasted for centuries in the Indian Ocean. Muhammad al-Fatih always made sure to have a huge naval fleet at the ready for war. When it came to geographic planning, Muhammad al-Fatih took no risks. He would sketch his strategies on maps with great care, with some reports stating that he took usually several days to complete his plan and others saying he would spend all night to analyze his war tactics, spotting any flaws, mistakes, and weaknesses in his planning. Muhammad al-Fatih didn't stop there. He looked at the historical sieges waged on Constantinople, trying to understand their mistakes and flawed tactics. By learning other sultans and Islamic leaders' mistake in overthrowing the Byzantine rule in Constantinople, he formulated a new strategy that previous leaders weren't able to come up with. That is to attack the city from two fronts, the land and the sea. Muhammad al-Fatih understood that the majority of leaders used land tactics to try and capture the city. This failed because the Byzantines was not affected by this, seeing that they used the sea for trade routes and war supplies. So to bypass this issue, Muhammad al-Fatih positioned his foot soldiers and cavalrymen on the land while his naval men was stationed at the seaways to barricade the ships carrying aid and war supplies from other Christian nations. Lastly, Muhammad al-Fatih ensured that his pre-war strategy success by taking a long and difficult route to Constantinople. This clouded Byzantine rulers thinking as it wasn't clear if the Ottomans were heading for them. The Sultan has used this tactic many times and famously rulers have surrendered to him without even putting up a fight as they didn't know the Ottomans were at their doorstep, leaving them unprepared. And so on 6 April 1453, the siege of Constantinople had begun. Wave after wave, the Ottomans attacked Constantinople's walls, but were unsuccessful. Even with their massive cannons, they were unable to do much damage to the walls. On the other side of the siege, Ottoman naval fleet suffered from the same issue and they could not enter the Golden Horn Bay due to the massive chain stretched across its entrance. All these problems were troubling Muhammad al-Fatih. He knew that if he were to be victorious, he would have to abandon his pre-war plans and adapt to the changing situation. Muhammad al-Fatih ordered the construction of a road of greased logs to drag his ships over the hill into the Golden Horn bypassing the chain barrier. The defenders were forced to disperse part of their forces to defend the sea walls along the Golden Horn. This gave the Ottomans the opportunity to launch a large scale final assault, attacking the walls with full force. The army besieged Constantinople and the Ottoman cannons started to fire their missiles at the fortified walls of the city day and night. From time to time, the Sultan surprised the enemy with a new war plan. The Byzantines were being overwhelmed at several different points. The Ottoman elite janissaries were ordered to press forward, pressuring the Byzantines to retreat. And shortly enough, Ottoman flags were seen on top of a small gate. Panic ensued and the Byzantine defense collapsed. Finally, after a 53-day siege on the 29th of May 1453, Sultan Muhammad had conquered Constantinople. Sultan Muhammad arrived on his horse in a great procession that included his ministers and army commanders. The Sultan's procession marched until it reached Hagia Sophia Church, where the people of the city had gathered. He dismounted from his horse and prayed two raka'as, thanking Allah who had blessed him with his conquest. Then the Sultan 
address the people of the city. Stand up, I am Sultan Muhammad. And I would like to tell you, your brothers and all the people present, that your lives and freedoms are protected. The Sultan ordered that the church be turned into a mosque. And for the first time, the call for prayer was heard from this place. Until now, this mosque is still known as the Mosque of Hagia Sophia. He also decided to take Constantinople as the capital of his country. It was called Islambul, meaning the House of Islam. Later on, the word was viciously twisted to become Istanbul. The Sultan was very tolerant and merciful with the people of the city and acted according to the teachings of Islam. He commanded his soldiers to treat their prisoners of war in a good manner. The Sultan himself paid the ransoms for a large number of prisoners of war from his own money. At the age of 23, he was able to conquer Constantinople when many others had failed. Later on, Muhammad al-Fatih had it to complete his conquests in the Balkans. He managed to conquer Serbia, Greece, Romania, Albania, and Bosnia, Herzegovina. He also looked forward to conquering Rome so that he could have another source of pride in addition to the conquest of Constantinople. In order to achieve this great hope, he needed to conquer Italy. He prepared a tremendous fleet for this mission. He managed to land his forces and a large number of cannons near the Italian city, Otranto. Consequently, he managed to capture its castle in July 1480 AC. Muhammad al-Fatih decided to take Otranto as a base for his northern military operations until he could reach Rome. The European world was terrified because of this attempt and they expected the fall of the historical city, Rome, into the hands of Muhammad al-Fatih. However, he died suddenly on 3rd May 1481 AC. He advised his son Bayezid II saying, Here I am dying, but I am not sorry because I have left you behind. Be righteous, just, and merciful. Donate liberally to the people and defend them without discrimination. The kings of the world are obligated to propagate Islam. Give religion to the highest priority and do not grow weary in its pursuit. Do not appoint those who are indifferent to religion and abstain from major sins, as well as those who have immersed themselves in wickedness and evil innovations. Extend the borders of our nation and ensure that the wealth of the treasury is not squandered. Never extend your hand to the wealth of a member of the populace unless permitted by Islamic law. Guarantee the weak for their strength and give freely to those who deserves.